Hello, <clears throat> welcome to this session on nurturing foreign direct investment. My name is Courtney Fingar, and I'm editor in chief of Investment Monitor, a publication focused on foreign direct investment. So I'm really looking forward to this discussion um, with with some experts in the field and and from a, a, a range of locations who'll be able to give us different perspectives, both from a geographical global, but also um, perspective of the different segments that they're covering. Let me introduce them to you. And, and also with the, with the urging, I guess, that we would love our participants to be able to ask us questions. So by all means, use the chat function and throw some questions our way. And we will make sure that we actively keep an eye on those and make sure that we get them answered for mm -hmm. you. We have Doug Brunke, founder and CEO of the Global Chamber. This is a global community of business leaders focused on helping companies grow, both in their locations and, and abroad. We have Andreas Schweitzer, Managing Director of Arjan Capital. This is a UK-based corporate finance M&A and trade advisory boutique with a specialism in complex global markets. We have Dinesh Joshi, Chairman and Managing Director of Satya Giri Ventures. Apologies if I've made any mispronunciation there. This is a diversified group with activities in the fields of shipping and infrastructure. Dinesh is also on the Board of Directors of IMC Chamber of Commerce and Industry, the oldest state-level chamber in India. We will, we hope, have Robert Herman, CEO of Germany Trade and Invest, which is, as it sounds, the National Trade and Investment Agency for Germany. I think we're having a little bit of difficulties getting Robert um, patched in. Now, with everything that is going on, and many of you probably just watched the special session that was convened on, on Ukraine, and it's a little difficult at a time like this to talk about normal business matters because it's certainly not business as usual anymore. That said, FDI has a crucial role to play, both in, in reacting to the, to the crisis, and we've seen actually foreign and international and domestic companies rallying to support efforts in Ukraine, for example. And there are many implications, both of the conflict itself, the disruption that it will cause, and also the sanctions uh, regimes that's been put into place. So we definitely need to talk a little bit about that with, of course, the, the disclaimer that this is, I suppose, the FDI side of things is minor in comparison to the human impact of, of the invasion of Ukraine and our thoughts and sympathies and, and, and our care goes out to all those um, affected. But FDI surely will have a role to play as well in, in any post-conflict recovery. And, and so that's something that we should keep in mind and, and be able to talk about. So I guess we should maybe first confront the issue of the instability that's been unleashed. Um, if I could, I'll, I'll start with Doug. I mean, Doug, you obviously through the Global Chamber are are speaking daily, if not on a minute to minute basis of executives and in, in companies worldwide, what is the feeling and how do you think the international business community should be reacting and responding to the crisis at this moment? On the business side, I would say, um, you know, it, it's slower, certainly on the humanitarian side, there are many more people involved and I encourage everyone to be involved. I know on the Global Chamber LinkedIn page, we have a series of, of, of humanitarian efforts that have been vetted that we encourage you uh, to participate in. Some of our members in Ukraine have given us some of those. And so I encourage you on the humanitarian side to, to be involved. On the business side, it's probably still too early to tell where this is all going. I mean, the mega trends are still kind of in place. Um, and... Uh, in the meantime, you know, we'll, we'll just keep shifting. Um, we, we actually have a Global Chamber Ukraine event on the 31st of March scheduled. Um, our hope and expectation had been when we set that up a few weeks ago that we would be talking about doing business in Ukraine and what the opportunities are, et cetera. That's still on the Global Chamber calendar. I hope and expect we can still do it. Uh, but, you know, the, the dynamics of the situation are are such that it's a day to day. So let's let's hope and uh, and, and, and pray or whatever your appropriate manner is that the fighting will be stopped and that the Ukrainians can get back to doing business just like us. Yes, I hope so as well. And Ukraine is a 
is a market with enormous amount of potential and lots to offer foreign investors if it can regain, um, we hope, um, its stability and peace there. Andreas, I'd like to ask you, as our resident trade guy here, um, there are obviously enormous implications uh, for trade in, in not just the disruption by the conflict, but the sanctions. What are your expectations? Yeah, it's very early. It's a bit of coffee cup reading, of course. But the reason why we like trade uh, more than we used to like it before already is in volatile stock market, it's basically a fixed income product. And uh, you could look at is trade, a fi- is, is trade a foreign direct investment? I make the case it very much is because if you invest money into a, uh, a metal press or if you sell the metal sheet, at the end, if you don't sell the metal sheet, the metal press doesn't get paid. So <laughs> it's a bit an issue where in the value chain you want to be and you are. Then if you take one of the largest trading houses, for example, take the Cargill case or any other of these cases today, they are in the agricultural business um, owning farms until selling the product to the consumer. So uh, I believe uh, uh, trade is a very secure way of investing because you are not, it's not equity backed, it's product backed. It's a, many of our listeners might say yes, but it's a different case. It is and it isn't. A long discussion we can weave out of that, but trade will now uh, become much different because Russia is basically excluded from trade, like from all other things. And even if that trade, if that war, this awful war would stop in some form sooner rather than later, I don't think these sanctions will go away for a long time. And to undo sanctions, if you look at the North Korea sanction, if you look at the Iran sanction, another case we know particularly well, this is so engraved in legal systems. Uh, look at Africa sanctions. So navigating sanctions is a, such a business that we have an in-house lawyer on the, on the team because we keep him busy with ridiculous, unproductive things, if you want. But this is how the world has turned into, and we we simply have to live with it. Yes, and uh, sadly, your lawyer is going to be extremely busy, um, in particular now as we unpack all all of the myriad, I guess, complexities to do with this sanctions. Dinesh, what is the view from India as you see it, and obviously as a representative of, of a business yourself and through your work with local chambers there? Thanks, Courtney. Um, so, I mean, I would certainly uh, you know, agree with what Doug has said. It's, it's indeed a humanitarian crisis, no doubt. I think what is most important right now is to save lives and livelihoods. As far as India is concerned, there have been, you know, uh, I can say um, a stand which we have taken. We need to bring our students back. And more than 90% of the students have come back. 10% are there. And our ministers, uh, the central ministers have themselves, uh, you know, flown to Romania, Poland, and, you know, yeah, nearby countries to make sure that we have our students back. Secondly, India has a good amount of investment into Russia uh, as far as the oil and gas sector is concerned. India has been a very good friend of Russia. But that does not mean that, you know, one doesn't condemn what is happening, uh, you know, because of Russia. And at least as far as the business community is concerned, we would like to have the business back on track because the world has suffered for the last two years. And as we are just seeing some green shoots and this has happened, which is certainly not a very good sign. And we don't want to suffer, you know, for one, one or two more years. So it is certainly going to have a lot of impact on uh, global trade. It's going to have impact on investments from India and to India and other parts of the world. So I I feel that the earlier, uh, you know, this uh, incursion stops, it is better for the world. Otherwise, it is certainly going to land in a very big disaster. Yes, you're right. And there is an an awful irony in the fact that as we start to see some recovery in order and and get a little bit back to to business that that this turmoil has been unleashed, 
I'm curious um, from from all of you if we if we set aside the 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 turmoils of of the war, what are your general expectations of global um, investment, trade, and business trends? What do you think are the ones that are going to most shape the investment landscape this year and beyond? And uh, Doug, I'll put that first to you. I'm, I'm, I'm an optimist, but I hopefully am also a realist. I've been involved with international business for 35 years. And so I've kind of seen a, a lot of different things and mostly been able to, to uh, see certainly the general trend that globalization continues to advance and move forward. I wrote down a few things that I just have observed through our chapters and 525 metros around the world, some of the thoughts and processes that, uh, that I've been listening to over the last several months. Um, certainly, um, you know, in the U.S., since this is a U.S., uh, I think, maybe centered, or at least there's certainly an element of the U.S. You know, in, the, in this program overall, uh, the U.S. is, I think, back on track with immigration, and that's a good thing for the U.S., and it's a good thing for the world. It doesn't mean the legislation and all the processes have caught up with kind of the direction of the company or the country, but but in general, things are moving in the right direction instead of the wrong direction that it, that it was headed. Uh, the joke uh, recently was that instead of infrastructure week, which it had been talked about for four years, it's now the infrastructure decade in the U.S. And similar to around the world, infrastructure is a key area of growth for FDI, and I think that'll be the case in the U.S. as well. Uh, you've got issues around the mega region, Mexico, U.S., Canada, when I say issues, I say it in a positive way. That continues to advance and move forward opportunities for foreign direct investment in the U.S. I think more than ever, women are coming into trade. You know, even though the the quote-unquote experts here, other than you, Courtney, are all men, generally, you know, certainly in our events, mostly we have women that are talking about what's happening in trade. We just did a Women in Economic Development conference where it was all women. Um, and it's clear that women are playing more and more of a role uh, around the world in almost every country. And that's a good thing, you know, based on what we've seen. And then I think we've got some other things happening in the world, like the transition from fossil fuel vehicles to to electric vehicles. You've got automated vehicles happening, and that's driving kind of the, the, the Uberization, if you will, of the world, which is opening up opportunities. The semiconductor industry is evolving where the next iteration of technology is a huge amount of investment. And so we're seeing five, 10, $20 billion being thrown at the next generation of products. And we've got, of course, a shortage and, and issues related to that. There's a Ukraine connection on that piece as well. We've got e-commerce, we've got technology and fintech blockchain, uh, cyber uh, uh, issues, but cryptocurrency, uh, NFTs, which I still can't explain, but hopefully <laughs> hope to someday. Um, uh, and the cannabis market, I'll end with that. You know, uh, that's it's definitely not going up in smoke. It's advancing. And so uh, we've got a process or progress in Mexico coming up next month in Costa Rica, where it's being legalized, and also in Germany. And so we're seeing eventually, I think, a supply chain for the cannabis market that's going to open up even more opportunities. So that's at least some of the things that we're seeing across the Global Chamber Network. Yes, and that's quite a grab bag of opportunities, actually, from, I guess, big, big, chunky, traditional things like infrastructure through to new technologies, renewable energy, NFTs, and even even cannabis. So we appreciate that that dose of optimism. And it's true that there are enormous opportunities being unleashed by by innovations um, and by changes and also by government policies and, and the facilitative environment for investment. What concerns your members, Doug? What worries them a little bit as they as they scan the business horizon? Or I guess to put it another way, what hurdles do they tend to face as they move into new markets that policymakers should be looking at? Well, one clear one is supply chain, right? So the, it's, it's driving resourcing. I guess that's one of the other trends that's happening, right? Production, not so much shifting out of China. I think what we see more is like the next generation of manufacturing not being done in China, but doing 
doing it in Vietnam, Malaysia, India, maybe should be more in India, but it's not happening. And Mexico, Mexico's had a record year in terms of uh, investment on manufacturing facilities to be able to be closer to, to, to location. I think it was mentioned in the State of the Union address by President Biden about going after these shipping lines. I, I forget the exact numbers, but last year they made, what, $130 billion collectively. The year before it was 20 or $30 billion. And then the previous 10 years was 20 or $30 billion total in aggregate. So they figured out how to rig the system and, you know, it, it isn't helping, you know, but it's also creating opportunity in Mexico and other places because people are trying to get manufacturing close by. So that's a concern, but it's an opportunity. And, and we, tr we, we try to think of things in, in, in those terms. I think in the investment monitor, you talked about three concerns uh, or opportunities, Chinese investment, uh, the, the issues around democracy around the world and inequality, I think all of those are both problems and opportunities. And I don't think our members are necessarily articulating concern about any of those. They're just, they're just doing business. And I think ultimately what makes me an optimist is that money finds a way. You know, if you try to stop at one place, it'll find another place to, to go. And that's kind of the dynamics of what we see within Global Chamber is, oh, OK, that's happening. OK, let me shift over here. And that's certainly something that we encourage. Thank you. And, and I'm glad you've been reading and checking out Investment Monitor. And you're right about these big macro, I guess, themes that, that we've been focusing heavily on. Dinesh, I want to bring you in here. Doug mentioned, first of all, India. Um, and I'm curious where you see India fitting into the new global value chains, first of all. And India is obviously extremely significant as a destination, but also a source of FDI. So where is India in, in the, the new world that's emerging? Sure. We have seen the highest uh, FDI in last year, $81.72 billion, which was a jump in 58% as compared to, if you see the cumulative years of seven years, the total investment that came into India was $440 billion. Whereas last year itself, we got $81.72 billion. Most of the investment came from Singapore, followed by U.S., Mauritius, uh, UAE. Um, apart from that, I can say a government of India has done a lot and a lot for the MSME sector, for the manufacturing sector, and also for uh, the infrastructure sector. We have started a scheme called PLI scheme, which is Performance Link Incentives. And Performance Link in Incentive scheme is such that you manufacture the components in India, not necessary for an Indian company, but any other company, uh, you know, you're welcome to uh, set up your base and uh, manufacture. Uh, the scheme is about, I can say, four billion, three, three and a half to four billion dollars incentives, what government has given, which ranges from auto components, automobile, aviation, chemical, electronic system, food processing, medical devices, and so on. So we have seen a lot of investment coming into this sector. Semiconductor is going to be a very important sector, as Doug rightly mentioned. And it, I think worldwide, it's going to be a very important sector for investment. We have seen 40 unicorns uh, coming out of India in last year itself. And this year, we hope to have at least another 20 more. It has created more than, I can say, thousands of jobs. And um, uh, out of, I can say, 2,000, uh, you know, um, major startups in the world, 93 of them have been people from Indian origin who have been heading it. Uh, just shifting from that, but what we look at is uh, we, we are going to see a lot of investments coming in, not just from uh, US or Singapore, but mainly it's going to be from UAE and the Gulf region. Okay. India has signed a comprehensive economic partnership agreement with UAE, which was done in a record time of 88 days. And in that, basically, is there will be investments coming from UAE because there are a lot of sovereign funds in the UAE, which is going to be helped uh, to, you know, I can say, energize the infrastructure sector. And um, also for the manufacturing or for the supply chain, for that matter, and more than, I can say, 70 to 80 percent of the products which, which had duty have become now completely zero percent duty. 
So that is a very important step which India has taken in signing this India UAE Comprehensive uh, Treaty. The next is going to be followed by India GCC and India Australia. So we are going to see a lot of uh, I can say investment, trade, <coughs> supply chain issues <coughs> getting sorted. But mainly it's going to be the infrastructure sector which is going to be I can say completely revitalized. The government has planned around 1.4 trillion dollars. of investment into infrastructure from 2019 to 2023 out of which 750 billion dollars itself is into the uh, the sector of railways uh, we are going to have another 25000 kilometers of uh, you know roads and highways coming up so for that again the uh, infrastructure sector is going to be a very important uh, one which uh, we will see a lot of investments coming up from us too and also from various other places but what i see is i i can see this is a golden period for india mm-hmm. and i'm sure that uh, it, it is going to be certainly very beneficial for the investors who would be coming here because there is there is a lot of potential in development in in various kinds of uh, uh, you know sectors even in the uh, msmes the government has given a lot of support to them as far as giving them you know uh, emergency credit guarantee uh you know where they have taken loans in uh, 2020 if they have not been able to pay the government has been giving uh, you know guarantees so that uh, you know the msme sector does not get affected uh, to a great extent so i see a lot of potential coming in mainly from the manufacturing side the infrastructure side mm-hmm. and another uh, uh, i i i feel that uh, which is going to be very important will be the agriculture sector. india can be a very important destination for giving food i mean taking care of food security for various nations and uh, uae has invested into india uh, india uae cooperation on agriculture is very very strong and whether it is not just growing of fruits and vegetables but it's also on the food processing so agriculture is going to be very very important uh, investment which is going to come in Yes, and food security is going to be an increasingly important issue of our time, and that has raised agribusiness up the the list of priority sectors for both investors and host countries. We find on a on a global basis. Um, I'd I'd like to thank you for for that analysis, Dinesh. I'd like to turn to Andreas and ask, um, for your perspective, where are you and your clients seeing opportunities? um and where are constraints and bottlenecks and difficulties my uh, opportunities are always there where you know the market so if you are in india there are indian opportunities if you are in uzbekistan there are uzbek opportunities mm-hmm. uh, we have we know central asia quite a lot but what we have realized is that we don't really need to go that far the opportunity <clears throat> is staring at us in switzerland in my own country the swiss sme companies have a hard time to get financing large banks have deals with large companies and the other way around mid-sized companies all over the place in europe and maybe also india i wouldn't know have real issues and that's where the trade finance comes in so we are looking at the moment at switzerland where we have a non-finance pipeline of nearly 2 billion for credit insured receivable financing so here's a credit insurer that guarantees the payment pretty wacky if you get compare that with minus 3% in the bank account so th- th- there is an inefficiency which we want to benefit from greece is an interesting market a very small one but a, a good one then we have imports into germany so we have german obligors credit insured and um, the other big place is brazil for us because it's just it's a, it sounds eclectic but we go wherever we have a good team so uh, return is secondary to to a good quality team and brazil has an endless financial appetite you know they are they are so enormous and uh, this is where we see the markets we are not uh, looking any more into markets like into marginal markets like africa or central asia because we believe this is a comp- needs a different know-how and this needs an awful lot of local now know-how and presence on the ground 
and um, middle UAE for for uh, is becoming very active not only in crypto but also in trade finance. Mm -hmm. The disadvantage in the UAE is every LC now has to be a hundred percent collateralized, so there's not much credit left in the world letter of credit. But it is, it is, it is Saudi is a bit more difficult. India for trade, we find it also a bit complex, a bit like China. So we're, we're at the home, we are a little bit homegrown in Europe where we see our opportunity. And your, your clients, if I understand correctly, are, a lot of, are largely um, SMEs. Um, what to what extent do you see their their level of bullishness as we hopefully come into recovery for seeking out international opportunities? Sorry, can you say that again, Zengpa? Your SME clients yeah. um, are they do you are they largely bullish at this at this moment and and looking actively for international opportunities? Are they coming a bit back to life? How do you see their their mood as they scan the global horizon? I would say. At least in Europe and also in the UK, the mood is not too bad, except you are, if you are in retail. I mean, and retail and retail, real estate, if you walk through Oxford Street, it's it's just not a pretty picture if all the, all the shops close and that. But uh, again, if I look at Switzerland, machine manufacturing uh, runs very well. I think Italy has very good opportunities. So uh, the pandemic... Uh, has done much less damage than one would have thought. It has done great for uh, online sales and certain industry, but if you try to take the the bulk of it, I would say uh, a, f a few a few industries, the rental industry maybe, uh, the, the real estate industry has 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 issues office rentals, but the manufacturing, the the mood is probably reasonably okay. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, and I, but I think people probably there is not a, a vast desire to invest somewhere else. I think it's an issue of consolidation and solidify what there is. Yeah, it, Doug, does that does that fit how you see that your your members and, and partners are <laughs> operating and and viewing opportunities? Has it, their expansion strategies changed in these last few years? I, I'd say generally true. I, I somewhat, uh, I see a little bit different picture for Africa. I think those that have the appetite, and maybe Andreas was really saying this, is if you've got the experience and a good team on the ground in Africa, you can do some really good work. I'm I'm very bullish on Africa. Uh, I mentioned earlier, 35 years for me, my first, my first international trip was to Seoul, uh, and to Busan and Ulsan, South Korea. And 35 years ago, it felt like it was so backward. I remember visiting the Hyundai plant and it was just like crazy. It's like, you, can, you can't even make a car, you know, this is crazy. But that was 35 years ago and they learned and they worked very hard to get world-class and they're amazing as we all know now. I, I think it's going to probably take longer for Africa, but what we have in Africa are a lot of really smart people getting better and better educated and also appreciating that trade is important. Um, and so building the mentality around an export economy and creating you know, fa factories and plants there in Africa you've got the, is important. And you've got, of course, the other issue where governments play a key role in foreign direct investment, right? And having st stable governments that don't have corruption are really essential. And so those countries that have much less of that are advancing. Ghana would be a great example of that, where we have a very strong chapter in Accra, Ghana. Uh, we, a lot of trade coming in and out, very strong um, uh, relative to many other countries. There are a number of maybe another half dozen countries that we're very bullish on. So I'd, I'd say, Andreas, uh, what he talked about, we're seeing similarly, although I would add Africa to the mix as well. Yes, yeah, certainly. And, um, you know, some of the factors that companies tend to consider, you mentioned about the operating environment, ease of doing business, um, lack of Corruption, I guess, talent is always top of the list. And you also cited that as a factor in Africa. What I'm interested in in the talent equation is how remote working 
has maybe changed that. So where people are based and, and who gets to count someone as talent in terms of where they are physically sitting, where are they locating? Is this something that the companies that you work with, Doug, is this top of mind? And how are they recalculating how they structure a global workforce and how they view talent as an investment criteria? So this is an amazing development. I love what's happening here. I was kind of part of the nearshoring of the information technology out of Mexico into the U.S. by helping some folks develop that market. At the time, 15 years ago, there wasn't enough talent in Mexico to be able to provide information technology resources into the U.S. That was the idea. So the government stepped forward and, and encouraged people, universities as well, through private development, private companies encourage both the government and universities to get more students trained and build the pipeline. And that worked. That happened. And so that was 15 years ago. And now that's a normal thing. Those of us, you know, sorry, Dinesh, you know, uh, those of us that have had that experience of a remote IT support, we know the challenges, right? A lot of those have, through technology, have evolved, but having nearshoring and having remote services nearby helps a lot. But I think technology is facilitating and leadership techniques are facilitating today's world, which says, hey, I need talent. I can't get it locally. Let's look in our own time zone, north, south, because that's if we're in the same time zone, at least we can facilitate mostly you know, better communications. And if we can't do that, there are technologies that are enabling the broader view, right? Having a team globally and more and more companies, the multinationals have always been doing this. Now SMEs are very involved in having global teams and the technology is facilitating that. And I'm very excited about that. That was my dream with Global Chamber. At seven years ago, I thought, why are people going to Asia like five times and, and then maybe they get some business out of it? This is a, like a crazy process. It doesn't make any sense. And now COVID basically forced us to say, you know, you can actually get business on, you know, through Zoom. <laughs> you know, what, a, what a concept. That's a good development. And, and I think it, it, it then leads the way to the next step in your question is, why can't our employees be anywhere? And, and more and more companies, maybe almost everybody realizes that now. Yes, and, and it certainly forces a major rethink um, and it has big impacts on a place like India. So Dinesh, we should certainly ask you to, to react. <laughs> India is obviously a, a Goliath of IT outsourcing how do these new ways of working impact India as a destination for outsourcing? Sure. We have, we have seen a great uh, amount of uh, development in digitization in the last three to four years. And I can say that that paid a lot of, uh, you know, during the pandemic. Because we have these IT giants who have, I mean, rather, I can say they have served the world. But most important, uh, you know, I can say a gesture of, from, on part of the government, what we saw that in one day, overnight, 320 million people in within five minutes, they received, I can say, subsidies or in the people who are at the bottom of the pyramid and they received it within five minutes. It was the power of digitization, what we saw. Secondly, as far as... Um, you know, the um, remote working, everybody has been used to remote working. And last two years have really taught us a lot. And, uh, you know, we had a Zoom platform undoubtedly has helped, I can say, millions to develop the business. And I, I can see even, you know, build their, uh, you know, uh, I mean, sustain their current businesses. So digitization is certainly, it's uh, very important. India is moving to a cashless society. India is very powerful as far as fintech is concerned today. So I can see that technology, as uh, Doug rightly said, is really extremely important. And, and I think we have, you know, we have coped quite well. Uh, even as far as blockchain is concerned, India is doing extremely well. So we are more or less used to, you know, working for, from home. And... Uh, I mean, on a personal level, I've been more or less on working from home for the last couple of years because I have a you know, considerable part of my business in Netherlands. 
uh, when I've been, you know, investing and mentoring the startups and also in the Caribbean in the natural resources. I just want to deviate, a, a, you know, a bit and, you know, just uh, correct few statements uh, if you don't, uh, my, <laughs> if you don't get me wrong. Doug, you mentioned about, uh, you know, uh, you know, Vietnam and Malaysia, but uh, let me just, uh, you know, apprise you that India is much, much more uh, ahead in attracting investment as compared to Malaysia. The, the investment that came out from China went into Vietnam, which, is, which has been a preferred destination, no doubt. And the next has been uh, India, where we have seen considerable amount of large corporates who have come, you know, Foxconn and a couple of other, uh, you know, large corporates who have come into uh, India. Uh, I was personally there in Vietnam three years ago with the president of India's delegation. And what was more appalling, that the entire Vietnam has got only 250,000 uh, hospital beds. Which is, which is, I can say, you know, there's a lot of potential to have healthcare facilities, quality healthcare facilities. And we have got very good, I can say, super specialty hospitals in India. I'm not selling India to you, but I'm just getting the <laughs> things in place. <laughs> and and I'm mean, uh, most welcome uh, for, for you all to come to India and see it for yourself. Uh, secondly, I've seen a lot of people complaining that they have lost money in India. And yeah, because I would like to take this uh, statement and I certainly do agree with them, but it's not just in India, it's other part of the world. I have lost money in Africa. But I think what many of us forget is, you know, we need to understand the social and the cultural aspects, the way of business. It is your local partner who is also very important. Tomorrow you just fly down from UK or, you know, US and meet some, you know, riffraff on the way. But then it's India or UAE, you're bound to lose, uh, you know, um, your money and uh, we as a chamber last year we did uh, you know uh, did some exercise uh, you know for for african companies and for uh, you know us based company i had the uh, indo africa virtual summit which was covered on 48 uh, countries live on cnbc africa channel how we can cooperate between india and africa and we had african leaders in business and political leaders and from the indian side also where we saw that you know, considerable amount of investment which went from India into infrastructure, into automobile, into uh, natural resources have been secured in Africa because they got the right partners and vice versa. Similarly, in US also, uh, we had the Indo-US uh, Partnership Summit uh, where uh, you had, we had governors of states and we had central ministers out here where uh, I can see India, US has defined completely a different chapter now. And our, uh, we have strengthened our relation as far as investment, as far as bilateral trade is concerned and diplomacy is concerned. So I think it's all, you know, important how you get your things right by having, you know, understanding a culture. I mean, the culture in Switzerland would be different as compared to U.S. as compared to Africa. So I think if we do not understand the basic culture or even the way of doing business, we are bound to make mistakes. Yeah, that is a fantastic point. And, and following on your comment about Africa, I remember seeing some data a few years ago, and a lot is made of Chinese investment into Africa, for example, but of the actual corporate investment. So on the ground, physical facilities of companies or greenfield investment, India is actually a larger investor in China when it comes to companies setting up physical facilities on the ground, which is quite interesting and a little bit untold and further to your point. Um, I want to ask Andreas, are, are we missing anything here? And what do you see as the implications of some of these, these trends and changes that we've been talking about the last few minutes? Uh, <clears throat> what what uh... What you have said uh, do at uh, at the beginning that globalization is continuing, it it is yes. It's to us it's a yes, but because if I touch upon the payment situation, and we just this week had a very odd case uh, for an Indian client whom we advised on some investment uh, somewhere in Asia. And it was a small amount to pay us, and it was literally impossible. And at the end, they pay us from four different parties, which don't connect to the invoice, and we have one big discussion with the bank. What is this? Why is it? Et cetera. So 
the, the banking system, foreign exchange is for us a very important role. And what we have realized what makes life easier and where well, globalization for us came to a hard stop, there is no international bank. <laughs> There is there is local banking. If you are in the Middle East, you better have a Middle East bank account. In Europe, you have a European one. We even have a UK and a, 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 a European a EU bank account, and um, it is it has become cross border has become a big hindrance. Cross border in payment is 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 a very big issue. Now, I'm not saying that uh, AML and compliance are not important, but there is also a point where you wonder how many boxes can one really, uh, can one and should one tick and where does it become ridiculous? And it, it's something ringing. I hope this is not on my end. It was on my end. I do apologize. <laughs> uh, then, I'm, then I feel much better already. <laughs> but, so, so, so this is 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 really, so, and, and this is where crypto comes in. We have a lot of clients who come to us now and say, "Can we pay in, pay in crypto? Can we be paid in crypto? You need account with crypto exchanges because banks are not very willing to send money to crypto exchange. So you you really have your own." A whole new forex environment, and I look at cryptocurrencies as as some sort of a foreign exchange currency. It's it's nothing else than that. We are not getting into a value discussion, but it's just a different way of of paying something. Mm-hmm. So uh, payment has become a big issue. Opening accounts, and here, for example, we open accounts for very large companies where you would say, I mean, are they capable? I think it's just a very uh, time consuming and intensive thing but to 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 come after this sort of not so positive statement to come back to where you think we have missed and i would say what i have learned now uh business as charity starts at home and look i think what you said also in the us and and uh, india danish offers opportunities I wonder, do we really have to look very far away or aren't there phenomenal good opportunities right down the road? And we see quite quite a lot of them. Maybe you invest somewhere because you have a good local partner who says, I need some money or you want to come with me or do it with me. But if I'm on my own, I would really be start here. The days where you rush to India, I don't even think one rushes to Vietnam anymore. One still rushes to Africa because it's it's one of the last frontiers. One day people might rush back to Iran if there's a deal, maybe much less than there used to be. Um, the stands offer great opportunity. My colleagues run a, a private equity fund. I mean, this is very much uh, uh, FDI in Uzbekistan and, and other countries, but they have a whole team on the ground. So it's uh, you have to value the resources you require for to, for the business you want to do. So the, I think this this is probably the biggest decision. Yes. And, how, and much, the, how much do I need to get it going and to keep it going? Yes, and, and what you're what you're discussing is is backed up by a, a trend that we've seen certainly since the COVID crisis of of more re- localism and more regionalism, perhaps as a counterweight to to um, longer stretch thin uh, value chains across the world. Um, but I think we can't count out that the the world is big and there are lots of opportunities there. Companies will continue to seek them out, but we will be watching and seeing to what extent this trend of regionalization, and as you mentioned, looking a little closer to home, does that last or as we seek, as we recover do the do the horizons perhaps get get broader again? Um, we won't really solve that dilemma, I guess. I guess right now, and we're coming to time with our session, which is named because there's a lot more. I would love to ask all three of you, but I'll just conclude there and thank you uh, very much, Doug, Andreas, and Dinesh, for your time and your insights. Thanks to those who tuned in, and of course to the organizers for giving us 
this platform to discuss these issues. Thanks very Courtney, much. Courtney, it looks like we can go a little bit longer. Do you mind if I make one more point that I think was left out of the, the conversation? Sure, sure. And Daniel Zaretsky, who's in the audience, uh, pointed this out to me. It might have been a private message. But one of the things that he mentioned that we see that's critically important is youth. And Daniel sent that message to me during the conversation on Africa. And I think it's partly why I get really excited about what I see there is that there are a lot of young people in Africa and they want to change the world. And 35 years ago, when I was doing international business, I was just a young guy who didn't know anything. You know, it's like now when somebody comes in, they know technology, they have a different worldview, they want to make a social impact, they may not know how to do it yet. And so we do young global leader initiatives where we get folks with more experience together with the young people to accelerate their their progress. But I, I believe that part of the reason why it's going to be a different game in Africa is because of the youth. And and Daniel's point, who he knows a lot about Uzbekistan and Tajikistan and that region of Central Asia, his point to me has been you know, that that region doesn't use youth as uh, aggressively as other parts of the world. Latin America, by the way, is another area where I feel just like, wow, this is amazing what's happening. I think part of it, I hadn't thought of it, but probably it's also related to youth. To some extent, of Asia is that way as well. There's just an optimism and a positivity, you know, and a can-do attitude that doesn't happen as often in Europe, honestly, right? I'm Polish, Ameri Polish German American, and I know, you know, from you know that part of my background, the the Europeans tend to be very cautious and very slow and relative to new advances generally, and also uh, valuing experience versus youth. You know that whole that whole culture, and I think that's going to work to Europe's disadvantage uh, and to Europe's advantage. So I would say, if if we if we did talk about something that is important. I think youth is critically important. And I'll echo what Daniel mentioned to me. I think women in business, I've started out by mentioning that. I think that's a huge change and a dramatic uh, evolution that's happening in the world today. Um, and I'll, I'll finish off with the concept that Andreas talked about, which is trust. You know, that's why what you talked about, Andreas, was why I started Global Chamber is you know, the reason why people go to Europe five times to develop business and finally get a contract is they don't trust each other and they're, they have to see each other and go to dinner and, you know, like, oh, my God. But if Andreas and I know each other and trust each other for a number of years and he tells me about some person I need to know, don't I trust that person or at least the vetting process for that person that he's introducing to me is is a lot different than if it's just somebody cold. So I think there are technologies that we use at Global Chamber to speed up that process so that somebody like Andreas, who's sitting in London, who says, hey, maybe we should do something in Africa. Let, hey, Doug, who do you know that I should talk to? And now if he's developed that relationship with me, I give him somebody that can do a great job for him. And suddenly he's building you know, business there. Those kinds of mechanisms, I think, will keep globalization going. It, it's, it, I, I think it'll only accelerate because of technology and because of youth. So, so women, youth, and trust, I think those three things keep globalization uh, accelerating going forward, including, you know, of course, nurturing foreign direct investment. Thank you. Optimist till the end, Doug. So. <laughs> <laughs> Very, very much. Sorry, Andreas, yeah, but I think, I think we agree. Uh, uh, you, everything you said, I totally agree with. The, the key there is getting folks that you know that you know and trust. And and Dinesh on India, you know, I I love India. I've been going to India for many years. I, however, I spent ten years at the Indian Embassy in Jakarta one week. And that experience, I used to have dark hair, you know, but after that one week of experiencing the Indian visa process, you know, I, I turned gray. It didn't take very long. So I think we all know that the Indian processes tend to be, you know, a little bit elongated, um, and, but, but it's getting better. And I think Modi has part, is partially to, 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 bet, to say, hey, thank you, Prime Minister, and, and there'll be continued progress undoubtedly because to be in the world and to have globalization progress, India will need to keep making progress in that area. Uh, do you disagree or, or what do you think? I think we are coming out of the bureaucracy clutches. <laughs> because a few yeah. years ago, we had a lot of bureaucracy 
and uh, I think things have completely changed now. Many countries have got visa on arrival. Indians going to different countries have visa arrival and vice versa. So I mean, we ha- we have seen a significant amount of change. So I think you uh, please do come. I'm sure your uh, hair will become black again. If not, we have very good hair dyes also out here. <laughs> Yeah, no, I I love India. Like I, I said, I've traveled husband. all over, and uh, and I do. I had planned to go right before COVID, but I got stuck in Indonesia, and I I couldn't get in, so I did some virtual stuff. But I'll get back to India. We have we have a variety of teams: uh, Ahmedabad, Mumbai, Delhi, Kolkata, uh, Bangalore, etc., where we have chapters. So we're looking forward to continuing to help grow Please the do. business most, in and out of India. Most welcome. I think that will be something interesting. You'll see India in a different. Uh, perspective. Of course, there's just two uh, things which I just. By, to... by the way, sorry to interrupt you, Janesh. We we will uh, let you finish your comment. I believe Andreas has alerted me that he that he really has to go. I have so to leave say... you, unfortunately. But thank you very much. It thank you, wonderful. Andreas. Great thank to meet you. you. Thanks so That's much, a, Andreas. Bye. 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 I think I have a, another call I need to do too. But I'll I'll hang on, Dinesh, for your comment. Thanks, that's very nice of you. Uh, the, one of the most uh, significant market which is emerging right now is going to be Saudi Arabia. Mm-hmm. And one should not oh, miss it. Yeah. yeah. Could very I was well there be interesting. For, yeah. the, for the expo, I was a co-leader for a delegation, uh, largest delegation from India. And to what we saw, if we don't get into Saudi Arabia now, after five years, it's going to be too late. Yeah. Oh, that it makes a lot of sense. Definitely a big Definitely want to keep our eye on. You're quite right about that. Huge opportunities going on there. So thank you for pointing that out. And thank Courtney, you. Thank you. Thanks so much. I've enjoyed our conversation. I think we've made some connections here as well. Um, so it's much appreciated. And, and thanks again to you both. And, and thank you for our attendees. Thanks, everybody. Thank Take you. care. Thanks. Bye. Bye.